Hello everyone, welcome to episode 13 of Aster Yeah, the first episode derived from my experience in New York City. That was a short snippet of my NYC journey shot by my friends Scott and Jennifer, and they went with me to help capture footage I needed for these upcoming episodes, covering a range of topics that I want to talk about. I'll also be producing a six episode vlog series of my experience in New York. I went to New York City to learn about the historical background of its urban development and research urban design of the city through observations of how locals interact with the urban environment and how it affects their urban lives. This episode will be one of four big episodes to come out of this experience. For this episode, I'll be talking about three big topics, public spaces, placemaking, and pedestrianization. I'll also be talking about three prominent figures in New York's history which relate to these topics, William H. White, Jane Jacobs, and Robert Moses. I will be working on this area of Astoria, which I will call the Veradonde Plaza, and is located within the Hova Mill neighborhood. I will first start with the Veradonde Plaza and then move outwards to fill in the Hova Mill neighborhood. My objective here for the Veradonde Plaza is to create a sizable piece of public space with green space integrated into it. The streets surrounding the plaza and the framework of the Hova Mill neighborhood will be designed for multimodal purposes such as making space for pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicular traffic. I will also be trying out the new monorail system from the Mass Transit DLC as a replacement for my elevated tracks that I removed prior, but in a different layout. I think the monorails are less obstructed in a few ways and thinner in design to not deprive the land beneath it of life as overhead structures tend to do. But there is still an issue of noise pollution as the DLC counts the numbers as high values but I suppose in the future, we'd have nearly silent or completely silent monorails operating. As stated in episode 1, Astoria is designed to be a green futuristic city, and one of the main keys of achieving a green city is creating walkability and accessibility to public transportation. Now let's begin. The objective here is to obviously create an efficient piece of public space, so in order to make this plaza an efficient plaza, I turn to William H. White. William White is known for his studies of human behavior in urban settings, something I tried to do in New York. He worked for the New York City Planning Commission in 1969, and there he began to wonder why some urban spaces worked and some didn't, something that no one had previously researched. This curiosity led to the Street Life Project, which is a pioneering study of pedestrian behavior and city dynamics. Originally born and raised in Pennsylvania, and graduated from the Princeton University in New Jersey, he then served in the Marine Corps during World War II. After his service, he worked for the Fortune magazine as an editor, and he published his first book which gained notoriety called The Organization Man, which is a sociological and business commentary about corporate culture and the suburban middle class of the United States. He then turned his attention to the issues of suburban sprawl and urban revitalization, which at that time the urban renewal era was happening. White spent 16 years walking the streets of New York, where he made comprehensive studies of the city, documenting urban spaces and streetscapes with time-lapse photography and just simple observation. In 1958, the Seagram building was completed and had a successful plaza out in front of it. Due to the success of the plaza, the city of New York then had zoning provisions that provided for a greater density of office buildings in exchange for building public plazas. For example, an office will have additional floors built on top on exchange for building public space down below and around the building. But many of these public spaces failed and White wanted to know why, so he and his team of researchers went out to go investigate what made Seagram Plaza so successful. His street life project observed and analyzed interactions and behaviors of people at this plaza and other parks, and his findings identified a few key elements as to what makes a plaza a successful plaza. First, sitable space. It sounds very simple, but it's extremely vital to a plaza. But let me show you a snippet of White's film, The Social Life of Small Urban Places, in 1979, where he talks about this. This might not strike you as an intellectual bombshell, but this simple lesson is one that very few cities have ever heeded. They're tough places to sit in. And what's most aggravating are the number of plazas that would be excellent for sitting if only they weren't so high. Or wet. Or had fussy little railings placed to get you right in the small of the back. Here, another two inches and you'd be comfortable. Shrubbery and canted ledges, very useful for keeping people off. But we found that people are very adaptable. Press down on your heel and you can do it. Sometimes you gotta play rough. But, as we found out, people are very adaptable. Older people like to sit in the sun here. Can't have that. Management put in these stones. 
and now the older people don't sit here anymore. This artifact is a design object, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. It has some utility as a bench, but is usually placed in isolation. The dimensions are exquisitely wrong, and not just for physical reasons, important as they may be. Small benches are socially awkward. If there's a crowd, people will sit, but they're not very relaxed about it. So to the first recommendation, make the place sitable. Minimum suggested requirement, one linear foot of sitting space for every 30 square feet of open space. It's easy to meet. Moral, make the most of ledges, especially the front row. And make them two back sides deep. The point is not to double the number of sitters, but to give them more choice. And this is very important for their perception of crowding or not crowding. Here's an excellent example. Note how each surface can do double duty. Together, they provide almost an infinity of sitting combinations. Step ledges are good, and they offer lots of choice. They go very well with grass, grass that you can sit on. Planters make good sitting if they're not too high, as too many are. They should be low, and they should be hospitable. Here's a ledge which swings and is equally popular, front or back. The sitting table, which revolves. The most prolifically sitable place is 77 Water Street, sometimes known as Swingers Plaza. It has chairs, tables, benches, sitting sculpture, but it's the maze of ledges that make this place work so very well. And here are some of the swingers. Along with just having edges and ledges for people to sit, it's important to have multiple sitting environments where there are options for different sitting postures. Another key element to sitting is having movable chairs, as this next snippet, Mr. White explains. We come to that wonderful invention, the movable chair. It's one of the reasons you have such a feeling of choice at places like Paley or Greenacre. You are doing the deciding. It's very interesting to watch how people manipulate chairs. Here you can sort of tell there's going to be a rather aggressive movement. Now, whatever the purpose of all this rearranging, it does make for a rather pleasant social ritual, and you'll see many variants of this, often quite lengthy. Even when there's no apparent functional reason of any kind, people move chairs. Watch this girl. Now, she's no more in the sun than she was before. Watch this fellow. Very unusual behavior. This man is starting something. Soon we're going to have a game of musical chairs. Just why these men all started to move, one could never know. But they did. The interesting thing, though, is about four minutes after the beginning of this, all the chairs were back where they started from. The next element found in making Plaza successful is its relation to the street. White says, The street is the river of life of the city. They come to these places not to escape, but to partake of it. It's important because of the ease of access and visibility to a plaza. People who walk by the plaza on the street will oftentimes look at the plaza, and if they choose to go into the plaza, they can easily turn into the plaza from the street and vice versa when people leave. The streetscape and plaza are almost one where pedestrian flow is moving on the street and then becomes almost static in the plaza. The next element is skyscrapers and buildings in close proximity to the plaza or streets. Does the building look inviting or interesting enough to liven the streetscape? Is the building's architectural style too harsh on the visuals of the street because of things like blank walls? White noted that these brutal skyscrapers with non-entertaining street-level floors like parking garages or boring pillars are like urban fortresses that are hard and rigid. A simple fix is adding storefronts, windows, or doors on the first floor to make street level more pleasing to the eye, and this relates to Jeff Speck's rule of walkability of whether the walk is interesting or not. Also, the buildings must be close enough to the park 
for not only the ease of access, but creating a sense of enclosure for the plaza, much like what Jeff Speck said about the shapes of spaces and how buildings shape these spaces, and that there is also a height to width ratio. Sunken plazas are also entertaining and successful, such as Rockefeller Plaza because there's one thing that people like to do. People like to watch other people. People watching is very common, and it's everywhere, from a man sitting on his porch looking at people pass by his lawn, to people lounging around on a plaza looking at people around them, and a sunken plaza really reinforces this, as people atop the mezzanine look down on those below in the sunken area. They are like the stars of the show. Next is security. Having fences and other walls can be a double-edged sword. While it does create a sense of enclosure, it can also make an environment feel isolated or an entrapment where crime can happen within the depths of the park. But this can be solved by reducing the amount of walls to increase transparency from the streets. One example was at White's time, Bryant Park was known for drug dealers hiding within the depths of the park, but the park changed in the 1980s after his recommendations for better transparency. Next elements are, well, the fundamental elements like sun, trees, and water. The sun, depending on what climate you live in, can make a place feel comfortable, and it's important to allow sun to cast its light down onto the plaza. If the sun is completely absent from an area, it is at least essential to having light in the area. Without light, darkness takes over and can make a place look uninviting or not safe. An unintended side effect in small urban spaces in New York is light being reflected off of other buildings, which light up to other areas. Don't make too many tall buildings surrounding the open space, as they would completely cast their shadows. Water plays a role in that people like the sound of it. It can help mask traffic noise or any other noise. People also like to sit next to it, play with it, or relax in it. I experienced this at Washington Square Park with many people just relaxing on the edges of the fountain where they would stick their feet into it. Trees, as I said in other episodes, create microclimates and are admirable for their beauty, cast shade, and creates a canopy over our heads as a sense of security. There's a balance between the heat of the sun and the coolness of the shade by the tree. Have chairs next to the tree so people can sit under it. Next is food. Everyone loves food, and especially free or affordable food. In New York, food vendors can often park their carts at the edges of sidewalks or corners next to popular socialization spots like plazas or corporate buildings at lunchtime. Food also allows for people to extend their stay at the plaza for them to enjoy their food. Pertaining to the people watching fact, people who eat attract other people to eat. I mean, who would go to a restaurant with no one in it? There's probably something wrong with it. Outdoors Cafe provide this kind of atmosphere on streetscapes like that I've seen in Little Italy or other areas with chairs on the sidewalks. Then there's restaurants and parks themselves, such as Shake Shack at Madison Square Park, with a bountiful amount of trees creating a canopy for shade. Lastly, the element, triangulation. This is basically something that brings people together, an external stimuli. An example would be buskers playing music for people to watch and enjoy, or performers dancing or doing tricks to attract an audience, and this creates an environment where strangers can talk to other strangers, like how a wedding photographer saw me and my friend recording some buskers at Washington Square Park, and we did some small talk about each other's cameras and even exchanged business cards. Things like art can really spice up a public space, like plop art, which is temporary art that is installed at a public space, and some can be weird or controversial, and some can be pretty cool. For example, the Raging Bull and the Fearless Girl at Wall Street, which I personally didn't see. William White also mentioned this as the main point of these structures or murals are to stimulate interaction for people to congregate toward them and talk about it. These structures should not be in areas where they block pedestrian flow, but rather encourage it. This ties into placemaking, which I will cover soon. As a final note, creating public spaces in low-density areas can render it almost useless. Density is key to creating vibrant and bustling use of public space, and contribute to the street life that flows through our cities. Now the park is essentially finished, but before I give a tour, let's look at a recent example of applying White's observations in a plaza being created today, Times Square. This year, Times Square celebrated its completion after a six-year transformation from a congested thoroughfare into a European-style plaza. So I happen to be on the portion of Times Square that got pedestrianized uh, recently. This is where cars used to run through, but now they're really trying to transform this Times Square into more of a world-class plaza, as they would say. Uh, just trying to pedestrianize everything, but that side is still open to cars. It's really like a nice place to congregate, I guess you could say, where people could like you know, act, truly act as a plaza. Eventually, Times Square will really be a square. 
The designs for the transformation are by Snohetta, an international architectural design firm based in Norway and New York City with studios all over the world. Craig Dykers, co-founder of Snohetta, says that they doubled the amount of pedestrian space in Times Square. The objective was to create more pedestrian-friendly spaces in favor of people over cars. Their designs are very simple but effective because it isn't about designing a space for people, but allowing space for people to design it themselves and this is known as placemaking. The people, such as the community or active participants of a space, shape the way of how Times Square is used. Rather than designing something where you can pin it on an architect, placemaking requires humility, a modest and humble view of design which creates a blank canvas for local people to shape it themselves, such as vendors relocating to Times Square with tables and movable chairs, or businesses seeking to advertise with billboards and trailers, or the NYPD placing barricades any way they want, or just the dynamics of triangulation can change the flow of pedestrian traffic as paths get blocked by oversized crowds. There's also places to sit, having statues to look at, a place for people to congregate and socialize. It is a dynamic public space. Snohetta modeled and mapped out where most of the pedestrian flow was going and installed long slabs as benches running north and south on Broadway. These slabs are oriented toward one another to create room-like spaces. The firm also expanded crosswalks to 40 feet wide to prevent people from clustering at corners, which William White noted, a high traffic area where congestion can occur because people like to linger around corners. This is known as self-congestion, where people just congest themselves unintentionally in the middle of traffic flow. I recommend checking out William White's works of his many films and many books. He makes it entertaining with his wry humor, though a bit of it is outdated but for the most part it is still very relevant today. Now I went on a bad day to Times Square where it was raining so I didn't get the chance to see the benches get fully utilized, but I did see some people sit. Here's a diagram of the type of benches or long slabs that Snowheda has made for the sitable space in Times Square. As William White has said, sitable space is one of the most vital elements to creating a successful public space and creating sitting environments that allow for different sitting postures enhances the comfortability as people can be the decider of where and how they want to sit. These, these benches right here are part of a, the design of the pedestrianization of this. Uh, right now, not much people are sitting on it because of all the rain, but it's very important to be thoughtful to pedestrians to give seats for people. Uh, the experience could be much more enjoyable. Below on the image, you can see the types of sitting postures people can do with these large slabs. There are a number of ways to sit or lean or lay on these slabs. Despite having rained, rendering much of these slabs unusable to an extent due to the wetness, some people did sit on these slabs, and in certain ways like here, leaning against the slab, or here, sitting atop the slab to gain a higher vantage point, or here, a normal sitting posture. This is a form of expression, which always leads to healthier and happier residents. Triangulation is a big thing in Times Square as well. Aside from the people dressed up as comic book heroes, or Lady Liberty, or people just doing magic tricks, the many big and bright television screens on buildings is an external stimuli that attracts people and that's what makes Times Square a big tourist spot and a center of activity such as New Year's Eve. Let's take a look at Veradande Plaza now. As you can see, I've laid out a number of sitting locations throughout the park with different types of seats from benches to marble cubes for people to sit or lay on. I also laid out bollards all around the park at a reasonable height for people to sit on. If I could, I wish I could have the people lay on the grass rather than just standing around. Turning our attention to the next element, the streets surrounding the plaza. So far, I have minimally made structures around the park that would benefit the streets, but more of this element will come into the second part of this video. In this corner, I've placed a cafe that satisfies the next element of food. This little cafe was based on my experience in Madison Square Park, with a Shake Shack located within the depths of the park. There are many movable chairs around established on a gravel surface with a calming overcast effect by the tree's canopy. I tried to make it look as cozy as possible with potted plants as the main subject. There's also a bike shelter right next to it, adjacent to the monorail station for people to park their bikes or tick their bikes, or it could serve as a bike share station. In this corner, it's just a simple subway station with movable chairs and tables located around it with a bike shelter located behind the subway entrance. I also placed a few vendor carts, but I will get into more food places once I get into the next element of buildings later on in this video. Next is security. I've lined the edges of the park with a dense row of trees and short bushes, but some areas have sporadic placement of vegetation. 
This will allow for better visibility from the streets, and the many pathways into the park allow for better transparency and freedom for people to enter and leave the park. There is also a grand center that is unobstructed and spacious. Then there's the elements of sun, tree, and water. I will measure the sun values once the neighborhood is built with surrounding buildings. For water, there's a giant fountain right in the middle with benches and such. This will allow people to cool off and just enjoy the sound of flowing water. Then there's obviously trees which I've planted everywhere, but I did not want it to become a total forest. I want a good coverage of shade. I've mostly planted trees along the pathways and the edges while leaving the center bare open for green space. There's also a children's playground here that is not so dense with trees so parents can keep an eye on their children. But over here, I placed a dog park with a plethora of trees as dogs don't sweat so they pant in order to cool off. It's important to keep dogs cool so the shade from the trees should help aid that. There's also other amenities such as this basketball court and this tennis court. Then there's triangulation. There's no plop art structures here, but there is enough space on the grounds if any performers want to attract a crowd such as buskers. It would be cool if someone made a busker prop of animating characters playing instruments like a saxophone or a guitar, but you can count this archway as a piece of triangulation that draws people to it for the good views that looks out into the river, cutting between the Zadia and Yugen districts. I will continue to talk about pedestrianization and its relation to streets and neighborhoods, which also relates to the last two elements of buildings and streets from William White, which I minimally touched. But before we begin, let's talk about block size and types of streets. Now, some people love or hate the Great American Grid, but they do have some pros in that they are very easy to plan out, and hard to get lost in. For block sizes, achieving the right balance between land allocation used for productivity rather than just all roads while maintaining a good degree of walkability can be straightforward. Here we have a street grid that is similar to Portland, Oregon. It has many small blocks, great for walkability, but there's more land being allocated for street use rather than productivity of buildings. So how about the complete opposite? Huge block sizes? Here we have block sizes similar to what you'd see in Salt Lake City. These blocks are vastly too big and unwalkable. In real Salt Lake City, these blocks are bounded by vast six-lane roads and were intended that each Mormon member would get a block to themselves and use it for purposes like gardening or farming. This was set in the plans called the Platte of Zion. Unfortunately, the plan didn't reach its intended purpose due to the automobile as roads were being converted over in favor of motorization. Then there's the middle ground, these wide blocks as seen in New York, New York which provide enough space for productivity of store frontage and small enough for walkability, a human-scaled environment. I take inspiration from my experience in New York to design some blocks after seeing the picturesque street corridor scene of brown stones and trees lining the street. Here I have laid out the design grid for Hovamo below the Veredande Plaza and I will be focusing only on this area for this episode because I want to develop the other parts in the next few episodes. I am trying to make this a totally car-free zone, as the majority of Astroyea will be, and just reorganizing the public transit that exists around Astroyea to make it more optimized. But that will continue to be an ongoing process with the introduction of the monorail into the city. These roads are green because they are pretty much large bicycling paths, and if we look closer, I've designed these special streets which I call lawnways. Rather than people having their own lawns, there is a community lawn, which is the street in front where people can use it for a variety of purposes like children playing in the street or adults having a barbecue for a block party. It will be a piece of property maintained by the community, a collective effort. Over here is the main street cutting through the neighborhood, lined with bollards for protected bike lanes. Eliminating on-street parking for a multimodal design of allowing bicyclists and pedestrians and cars which are all autonomous that act like Uber or Lyft, so there's no need for parking or space allocated for parking. Therefore, more space for actual productivity, like people's homes or stores or public space for social congregation. Astroyea is supposed to be a human-scaled environment, much like New York was designed for human interaction, hence the density, until the age of motorization of which roads and streets had to be converted for the car. Currently in New York, there are many cases of vehicular and pedestrian accidents, and the city has tried to solve this by converting streets over to pedestrian use only, such as what I saw at Times Square. The streets are for the people. In relation to the streets, I will speak about the next prominent figure, Jane Jacobs. 
Jane Jacobs was a writer and activist best known for her writings about cities. Her first book and most notable one, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, published in 1961, sent shockwaves throughout the architectural and urban planning world. But before I go into depth about her, let me explain the ideology and the orthodoxies of the time of the urban planning world. It was at a time when modernist urban planning was shaping the United States. Modernism came about with the realization that land use, transport, and housing needed to be designed for each other because of their relationship with one another. It was supposedly a rational and scientific approach to urban planning. It was about creating order of organizing society by income levels and ethnicities so that it could be orderly and predictable. It was essentially utopian urban planning, as that was the goal. This type of urban planning was missing one obvious and critical element, the people. Cities are for people, not just for buildings, highways, or cars. Modernist urban planning lacked public opinion and took no regard for empirical evidence. The modernist model was about wholesome destruction of parts of the city to rebuild it anew with new housing projects and highways, but this completely disregarded the already complex social fabric that had existed in cities. From the first quarter of the 20th century, American urban cores were suffering from a number of problems, like crime due to economic hardship from the Depression or due to bad policy making of the Prohibition era unsanitary conditions, pollution from industrialization, and poor educational infrastructure. The Great Depression left one final blow to American urban cores as crime skyrocketed and other conditions strangled the lives of its citizens. People were looking for an escape from the city, of moving away from downtown and into the suburban neighborhoods springing up across the nation. This became to be known as white flight. To combat this, cities took on radical urban renewal policies, a set of policies designed to equip cities in order to compete with the growing popularity of suburbs. These policies of reversing urban decay were of modernist thinking and that cities were like the human body and it must be cured from the diseases that live within. The initiative involved the relocation of businesses, eradication of designated slums or new buildings, and the displacements of people for the segregation of communities by race or income levels, by slashing highways through the city to serve as borders or walls in order to revitalize American urban cores. This was one of the main drivers of the turmoils of the 1960s. I had one subscriber said that he thought separating people by race or income levels works best for everyone. Well, take a look at the modernist movement of urban renewal and the effects of this separation helped fuel the flames of the social movements of the 1960s and 70s and the crime spikes of the 1980s and 1990s that coincided with the crack epidemic. You cannot separate people into categories as that would destroy the social fabric of cities. We still see its effects today with some neighborhoods being neglected or cut off from the rest of the city and downtown remaining dead for much of the day. Lack of affordable housing is now a problem with many old buildings being destroyed in the removal. Today, the new urban renewal is gentrification, which is the indirect displacement of mostly low-income working people by renovating or introducing elements into a neighborhood that would increase property values to attract middle-class or wealthier people. Ironically, the Greenwich Village Jane Jacobs fought to save, which at her time was a working-class community, became gentrified and is now a posh and wealthy neighborhood of New York. In relation to modernist urban planning, I spoke about Le Corbusier previously in the episode with Jeff Speck, but he is one of the critical figures of the modernist urban renewal movement. He was a French Swiss architect who at one time took a flight over Paris. He was displeased by the sight of the city, saying that it was too chaotic and unorganized. He envisioned a fictional city called Radiant City and how the city was designed for the population placed vertically in skyscrapers of all the same style but surrounded by swaths of land and amenities like parks, schools, and malls, and this became to be known as Towers in the Park. With the automobile taking away, he wanted to connect these towering skyscrapers with highways where people would drive from tower to tower or to amenities. He wanted to completely eliminate street life by reducing the amount of streets and roads to avoid cross traffic. He proposed this idea of wanting to destroy large sections of Paris and rebuild it using his Towers in the Park concept, but this wasn't so popular among the Parisians. So his idea was exported to the United States when the urban renewal era was just about to begin with the Housing Act of 1949 kickstarting it. The history now brings me to New York City with Robert Moses, the master builder as he was nicknamed, gained absolute political power to shape the city any way he wanted. Prior to the Second World War, Robert Moses became involved in urban development, first by being the city's park commissioner. His mission was a noble one at first, and it was about helping the sickening condition of New York by building many parks and swimming pools to create a better quality of life. But as the Second World War began, Robert Moses had 12 diverse city and state government jobs that gave him absolute power over the urban development of the city. In order to further better the quality of life, he started his campaign of laying out highways throughout the city. He once said that cities are made by and for traffic. Without traffic, a city would be a ghost town. 
He got federal funding by designating the project as for defensive purposes in case the Germans attacked. In an effort to modernize the city as 60% of the nation owned cars in 1940, the future of cars was clear and these highways were mostly being laid through minority and immigrant neighborhoods where they had little political power to fight back. Along with this highway construction, he wanted to obliterate blighted areas of the city, which he literally called cancer, and that it must be precisely cut out. He destroyed as much as 2,000 communities all over New York, a huge displacement of people. He went on to destroying these designated slums to build these new housing projects modeled after Le Corbusier's Towers in the Parks designs to revitalize the city. But as you know, these public housing projects failed in later decades and turned into some of the nation's worst slums and most dangerous places to live, hence the colloquial term, the projects. We still see this today in countries like China, which are essentially creating the slums of the future. But some were successful, which weren't used as major housing projects, but for middle class housing like Stuyvesant Town on the East River of Manhattan, the largest housing development in the country's history. It was designed for returning veterans of World War II. These houses are inspired by the brownstones of New York as they really do have a certain charm of their own. I've always loved the look of brownstones since I have family near Philadelphia and I would sometimes travel up there and see brownstones whenever we drive around. Brownstones are pretty common around the northeast of the United States. I love that they are compact and allow for a higher density. I used these buildings by Lost Gecko because they would fit perfectly with my brownstone equivalent, but also because of their green roof to fit the theme of an eco city. Rather having lawns out in front of the house, lawns are placed on the roofs of buildings as well as the lawnways I mentioned earlier. I tried to add personalization to each house of using different plants and props around and on the houses. I wanted to place a bunch of trees not only for adding shade, and microclimate to the neighborhood, but also to add some privacy. Trees create a nice obstruction, but I also didn't want it to be like a jungle. I've also doubled the width of the roads to allow for more space for people to enjoy themselves of various activities and sports. Since neighborhoods are mixed use, I'm going to add a few more higher density residential buildings with offices and shops, so walking can truly be a pleasure and a convenience. Before I continue, let me take you back to New York City. So now I'm in Washington Square Park, right in the middle of Greenwich Village, the home of Jane Jacobs, an urbanist activist that stood up against the master builder Robert Moses. Right here, the arch behind me, this would have been the site for the highway that would run right through this park. Jane Jacobs and the community stood up against him and managed to save the park. And it's just amazing seeing how all this life right here, how much people are actually utilizing this park, but it would have been destroyed if that highway was built. In 1951, Jane Jacobs came into the picture when Robert Moses finalized his plans for a sunken highway ramp to cut right through Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village, which was her neighborhood. A four-lane highway ramp would go down through Greenwich Village and link up to his proposed Lower Manhattan Expressway, an elevated 10-lane superhighway connecting the Holland Tunnel, Manhattan Bridge, and Williamsburg Bridge. This highway development would have destroyed Soho, Little Italy, Chinatown, and the Lower East Side. Eventually, Jane Jacobs and the community won the battle against Robert Moses in stopping the highway ramp through Washington Square Park. This was the first major resistance in which he lost. But Robert Moses wanted revenge by designating her neighborhood as a slum in the guise of urban renewal. Another victory for Jane Jacobs and her community when they delabeled Greenwich Village from being a slum. The victory at Greenwich Village spawned a movement of neighborhoods to stop urban renewal and the Lower Manhattan Expressway. Eventually, the Lower Manhattan Expressway was defeated, and Robert Moses resigned as he lost support after five decades of power. But his legacy still lives on, with many other expressways he had built, such as the Cross Bronx Expressway, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, FDR Drive, and way more. Much of the inspiration in going into Verdadande Plaza comes from my experience at Washington Square Park. 
It was a pleasure spending some time there and observing how the space is utilized effectively by strangers and seeing some of the elements that William White observed, such as the fountain satisfying the water element as tourists and locals would crowd the pool of water for its soothing effect and recreation among children. Then there's the abundance of sitable space, from man-made sitting structures to sitting on the grass. And it's being used quite extensively here, which makes way for a great place to sit and talk about life while spectating others. As with spectating, there's triangulation of the landmark archway, buskers, performers, and just people playing games or sports that draws in a crowd. There's a nice coverage of trees on the edges and corners of the park where people play casual games of chess or checkers with neighbors or strangers and then the couple or family who are enjoying the nature within the city by sitting at a secluded bench within the park. I can keep going down the list of elements about this park but this park was really one of the most enjoyable moments of my trip to New York City along with other parks that I visited like Union Square, Madison Square Park, and Columbus Park. Central Park is a little bit different, but it's good in its own category of parks, as these smaller parks are more of neighborhood parks rather than giant city parks. I've enjoyed these parks because not only they were the most relaxing pieces of public spaces I've been to in my life, but just the sheer sight of other people using the park and great volumes speaks in a way that this is a great place to be that draws more and more strangers for probably the same reasons, a welcoming place. It is truly remarkable that Jane Jacobs and the community saved this park from a proposed sunken four-lane highway ramp that would not only bring in pollution and car noise, but could potentially ruin the already refined connections that this park has provided for the community around it. From my brief trip in New York, anywhere there were cars comes with a nuisance of honking and gridlock that produces a cloud of nasty exhaust, and that would truly destroy the atmosphere of the park. Going back to how Jane Jacobs shook the architecture and urban planning worlds is by her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. In her book, she explains things about cities that no one has ever thought about or considered among the urban planning world. While the planning professions at that time were accustomed to designing things by flying over the city and playing god mode of cutting things in and out on a playboard, Jane Jacobs said in order to truly understand the city and to solve its problems is by getting down on the ground and interacting with the locals rather than obliterating neighborhoods and building new ones with more amenities with the belief that it will work as if it was some kind of mathematical equation of addition and subtraction. But in reality, it made the problem much worse. In her book, it has four distinctive parts about how cities work and what makes them function effectively based on her life, empirical evidence, and observations in New York City. When she moved there, she became fascinated by the city dynamics and opportunities it has. In the first part, she talks about the peculiar nature of cities on a micro scale she begins by speaking about sidewalks. Sidewalks are not just carriers of pedestrian traffic, but it too is a public space. In order for a district to be successful, pedestrians must feel safe and secure with strangers. For this to happen, she coined the phrase, eyes on the street. Jane says that for a city street to be safe, eyes must be on the street. It's not just about the old ladies looking out of their balcony windows and spectating the street life down below, but also refers to the pedestrian traffic that flows throughout the day and night, and this comes with watchful eyes. You have a very low risk of crime being committed when many people are around in public. Here's a quote from her book. A city street equipped to handle strangers and to make a safety asset in itself out of the presence of strangers, as the streets of successful city neighborhoods always do, must have three main qualities. First, there must be a clear demarcation between what is public space and what is private space. Public and private spaces cannot ooze into each other as they do typically in suburban settings or in projects. Second, there must be eyes upon the street, eyes belonging to those we might call the natural proprietors of the street. The buildings on a street, equipped to handle strangers and to ensure the safety of both residents and strangers, must be oriented to the street. They cannot turn their backs or blank sides on it and leave it blind. And third, the sidewalk must have users on it fairly continuously both to add to the number of effective eyes on the street and to induce people in buildings along the street to watch the sidewalks in sufficient numbers. Nobody enjoys sitting on a stoop or looking out of a window at an empty street. Almost no one does such a thing. Large numbers of people entertain themselves off and on by watching street activity. 
The idea of eyes on the street has been poorly applied to suburban neighborhoods, with programs and policies like Neighborhood Watch. But this doesn't work all in the best of ways, because suburban neighborhoods have very little foot traffic on them, and anything on the street can look suspicious to a couple of nosy neighbors. These policies are pretty much voluntary of filling an active role or job of surveillance, which is the complete opposite of Jane Jacobs' idea of casual and least conscious surveillance by locals and pedestrian flow going throughout the day and night of the street. Constant exposure of a street by people such as early morning or late night joggers, dog walkers, trash men, mailmen or delivery men, store owners, customers, tourists, locals, kids, teenagers, young adults, seniors, and everyone who uses the street if there is a purpose on that street aids the street with their watchful eyes. Jacobs expressed the importance of local public characters within neighborhoods that strengthen the eyes upon the streets and help form a social network of dispersing community news and connecting the local population. However, if there is a rapid change in population of a neighborhood, eyes on the street is refreshed and jeopardizes the safety of the street. She also noted that many neighborhood parks fail because of their obscurity of safety. Many parks are isolated for crime to happen, such as drug dealing or bullies picking on children. She characterizes the street as a safe public space only if eyes are upon the street in which children are supervised by parents and locals. As modernist urban planners were aiming to eliminate all street life, believing that empty and quiet streets make way for safer neighborhoods, Jane Jacobs criticized that street life was vital to city life, with pedestrian flow in a street throughout the day comes with everyday activities and interactions that occur in a neighborhood, slowly builds up an intricate network of relationships between neighbors, and this creates a foundation of mutual trust, shared efforts, and resilience in times of trouble. She called this social capital. The second part of the book, she stresses the importance of diversity and speaks about the four generators of diversity. The first factor is primary and mixed uses. She says that primary uses such as work, education, museums, and public buildings are buildings considered as the anchors of a district. This generates secondary diversity in that it attracts people to a district and enterprises thrive in this response to the presence of primary uses. Each district should have at least one primary use to ensure enough activity within the district at different times. With having one primary use to ensure sufficient activity, mixed use is also important in which a neighborhood has a mixture of all kinds of residences, workplaces, and shops that bring people out onto the street all times of the day. Jane says, On successful city streets, people must appear at different times. Healthy cities develop in ways, as she described, organic, spontaneous, and untidy. Where an outsider may see disorder in a block's jumble of laundromats, bodegas, schools, apartments, and restaurants, but a local will find it wholesome and full of texture to everyday urban existence. Another quote, Intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. When offices exist alongside residences, shops, and public parks, a neighborhood is active throughout the day and night. This ongoing process leads to eyes on the street, which makes safe streets. The second factor is aged buildings in that there should be a mix of old and new buildings in a neighborhood, and the old buildings allow for affordable space for new businesses and other low or no project enterprises to settle. A street can have a variety of lower-end retailers in older buildings, with higher-end retailers in new buildings. There's more space for more choices to happen. The third factor is small blocks, in that a denser street network means more opportunities for retail and more chances for people to meet their neighbors. She noted that long blocks are isolating, and leads to stagnation and boredom among pedestrians, or that long blocks leads to specialization like wholesaling, of which offer little to bastard buyers. Long blocks are prescribed paths that may not be the most desirable path to a destination. Small blocks help give the area its diversity, as if it's not only more walkable, but allow for more interaction and opportunities that contribute to the social and economic life of a neighborhood. The fourth factor is population density. It's simple enough to know that if you put a lot of people in a small area, it will provide enough use for the city streets, parks, and enterprises. However, this doesn't necessarily mean higher density to the point of overcrowding. She notes that population densities should go as high as they need to go to stimulate maximum potential of diversity in a city, and overcrowding can frustrate this. Modernist planners typically attribute high density with high crime, but this is not true. Even suburbs like Los Angeles have horrible crime, or like the recent crime spikes in Chicago, which are happening outside the downtown center. The third part of the book speaks about the forces of decline and regeneration. This discusses the ideas on the tendency for great diversity to be self-destructive, where certain neighborhood districts become so popular with one particular use that there is no diversity left due to the profitability of that use. Jacob notes that problems are far more serious if this use is duplicated across districts, 
such as Detroit, which is a city known for automobile manufacturing, and when this industry died within the city, the city died with it too. Homogeneity cannot survive well in times of trouble. She also talks about border vacuums, which are physical obstructions that create boundaries, dead ends, and splitting the city into small fragments. This destroys the idea of what she noted for neighborhoods to survive by small blocks and many street and sidewalk connections with other neighborhoods and districts all around it. During the late 1940s and 1950s, the urban renewal movement sought to destroy slums in order to regenerate the lost area, and it was catastrophic. She warned that slums cannot be replaced by high-yield projects, as this does not overcome the problem that created the slum in the first place. Instead, the slum is redistributed amongst the other districts. Jane proposes that the key to unslumming a slum is stopping people from leaving the slum too fast. If a sense of community is strong enough, residents will more likely stay and over time develop their homes and neighborhood. For example, the North End in Boston. It was considered a slum and faced threats of urban renewal due to its dominant immigrant population of Italians. They faced discrimination during World War II and was segregated from the rest of the city by walling it off with the construction of the Central Artery Highway cutting through downtown Boston. But over time, the community was able to regenerate itself, affording to renovate their buildings and thrive as a source of tourism for Boston, with many neighborhood shops converting into restaurants. She then discusses the topic of money, with gradual money versus cataclysmic money. Money can only do harm when it destroys the four conditions for diversity. The basic idea is that a neighborhood isn't just about the buildings, but it's a canvas of people who live in, work in, and pass through it. A quick flood of cataclysmic money and the brief boom that follows the construction of new things wipes away the community that was there before along with its intricate network. Money must be continuously flowing from various sources of a local vibrant economy, hence gradual money. One of the most damaging ideas she noted is credit blacklisting by banks, which have severe implications on slums and their ability to unslum, as residents are unable to gain credit to start local enterprises or complete work on their homes. She then calls for different tactics for legislation within the planning department, especially with low-income housing schemes. The idea of separating people by income seems unnatural and generates a variety of problems and creates issues with local enterprises as their clients may not be able to afford their products. She proposes for subsidizing rent on private dwellings for low-income earners, thus dispersing the low-income population around the city. She also expressed her disdain for traffic arteries like parking lots and highways to serve the car as they create border vacuums and creators, which are devoid of activity. These structures erode sidewalks and reduces productivity. She acknowledges the need for cars, but believes that there should be far less. Lastly, she ends her book by saying that cities are an organized complexity. From Le Corbusier's eyes and many modernist urban planners, cities like New York appear to be a total disaster and chaotic, and try to make it orderly with their urban planning ideas. But Jane Jacobs says that cities are immensely complex and orderly chaotic. Cities function like ecosystems. Everything is connected to everything else, in intricate, particular ways that cannot be captured well by statistics or formulas. Only close observation and reasoning from the bottom up will do. Her book has been immensely influential throughout the urban planning world. She also went on to write several other books, which notes a few ideas. One is that form still follows function. Jane says that cities primarily serve human functions. Modernist architecture also followed the ethos of form follow function, with city planners catering to vehicle traffic at the expense of a thriving public realm. Fashion and technologies come and go, but what always remains relevant are the countless ways of how people use the city, how a city works as a whole, and whether or not our urban design and planning reflect and serve those functions. Her writings mention the idea of make many little plans, meaning the diversity of a good neighborhood can only be achieved when we allow many different people to pursue their own little plans, individually and collectively. Lastly, she encourages citizen science. Traditional top-down planning comprises of judgment by outsiders and therefore prescribe governmental policies for planning and development to remedy or improve a neighborhood, but this is usually inconsistent with the real-life functioning of city neighborhoods, and bottom-up community planning can prevent this unnatural dynamic. People who are best equipped to understand urban complexity are ordinary, interested citizens. Everyday users of the city learn more freely from what they see and experience firsthand. Urban planning where the public has a voice is crucial. Here's the finished neighborhood, and I'll start to go through the many small things that makes up this part of the neighborhood. First, I want to talk about pedestrian plazas. I've seen many examples of pedestrian plazas throughout New York City, as the city's objective is to stimulate street life.
My inspiration for this particular pedestrian plaza was taken from my experience at Madison Square Eats at Worth Square, next to Madison Square Park and Flatiron Building. I like the sight of these small plazas being utilized for small food fairs, where one could sit in the midst of an urban environment with towering buildings beside us. I've lined these pedestrian plazas with planters and potted plants, similar to what I saw in New York. I like that the large potted plants, full of dirt, are used as a sort of bollard, protecting the space. It not only protects, but adds to the picture of the plaza with its greenery. Very interesting seeing these uh, some of these intersections being pedestrianized, uh, but not completely. There's still some streets over here, still serving cars. But this area painted green over here are for pedestrians with a bunch of chairs and pigeons. I suppose this is another example of a pedestrianized street right next to Penn Station and Madison Square Garden. It's just interesting that they try to lay out tables and benches for uh, pedestrians to just chillax, adding public spaces in unconventional areas, such as former roads. Next, I left a few open lots for development in the next episode. I really tried to develop a balanced look of having taller buildings near the edges of this car-free neighborhood zone, such as pushing the taller buildings running along the Veredan de Plaza. I want to keep the height of the center mostly fitting the height of the brownstone equivalents, with some exceptions of taller residential buildings, commercial buildings, and office buildings in certain areas to make it not too uniform. I've placed schools, clinics, a library with the subway station, a fire station, and a police station within the mix to allow for better accessibility. This will allow for constant flow on the streets. As for mixed use, I've lined the main street with offices and commercial businesses, but I also minimally added commercial businesses like florists and tea houses into the midst of residential density. There are also many cafes and restaurants and bookstores that serves as incubators of creativity. There's a lot of detailing that has gone into this, but many other areas lack detailing because there's just so much to add into this small vibrant neighborhood portion that would extend my time of producing this episode, but so far I am pleased with how it turned out, of trying to create a vibrant neighborhood of complex connections and networks. I recommend reading Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and also The Power Broker, a biography of Robert Moses. Both are lengthy reads, but are worth it. A good way of understanding Jane Jacobs' book is simply by walking the streets of your city, hopefully a safe one. You can see the effects of gradual money and cataclysmic money. For gradual money, you see streets mixed with new and old buildings like in downtown or other districts versus entirely new planned communities or public housing projects from cataclysmic money. Also, if the film happened to be playing at a theater near you, I recommend checking out Citizen Jane, The Battle for the City, in which it explains the story of Jane Jacobs versus Robert Moses and the legacy of the modernist urban planning 
that is currently exported out to countries and cities like China and Dubai with huge urban development going on. Jane Jacobs' influence has spread throughout the urban planning world with more thoughtful developments oriented toward public transit, human-skilled environments, and bottom-up planning. Her influence is also in popular culture. One of my favorite cartoons as a kid was Hey Arnold, the life of a kid named Arnold living in an urban environment similar to Seattle and Brooklyn with his community of friends and family. This cartoon series holds many gems about urbanism which I didn't think about until now. Hey Arnold the movie has a story derived from the James Jacobs and Robert Moses battle of a developer coming in to demolish Arnold's neighborhood to make way for a new shopping mall. The language exhibited by the developer is exactly how the modernist urban planners talked. Although some of you in the affected area may have concerns about how this plan will impact your homes and businesses, let me assure you, change is good. This plan represents the end of urban decay, the end of your broken down shops and apartment buildings, the end of antiquated and dilapidated storefronts. It's time for a new world. Out with the old, in with the new. What's wrong with old things? Some old things are great. Yeah, like Mrs. Vitello. Whipper snapper. Pow! Now I want to talk about the meaning of Hovamel in Veradande. Firstly, Hovamel was proposed for the neighborhood by a subscriber, Joel. He recommended it because Hovamel is a collection of poems meaning words of the wise one, and that wise one is Odin. Odin is a relentless seeker of knowledge and wisdom and is willing to sacrifice anything for it. One example was his sacrifice of one of his eyes for a drink out of Mimir's well, or the well of Erd, of which the murky water held cosmic knowledge. In the Hovamel, he hung himself from the tree of Yggdrasil to reach into the well of Erd as a sacrifice for the knowledge of the runes. Runes are letters or symbols of some of the most powerful forces of the cosmos. Joel said this name choice symbolizes the sacrifice I've made to gain this knowledge to apply or change in this city of Aster Yeh. Which I actually found coincidentally funny, because I did sacrifice some personal belongings in order to afford this trip of obtaining this knowledge in New York City. In conjunction to Norse mythology and that the neighborhood already exists next to Lake Erd and the Yggdrasil ecology that I named in a previous episode, I named the plaza after Veredande. Veredande is one of the three Norns who spins the threads of fate. Veredande is the least understood Norner because she is the keeper of the present. It may be hard to understand as we view time as past and future, which are Erda and Skuld, the other two Norns, but the ordinariness of the present is where you find the truth of Veredande. The present moment cannot be quantified, and that is what Veredande consciousness is. To comprehend the moment without looking ahead or without looking behind us is a powerful thing. It is within that instead we are able to harness the ability to create, change, and write our own word, which is the concept corresponding to fate or personal destiny. If we root ourselves too deeply into the past or too far into the future, it forces us to take a predestined path. To accept the present and live in the moment, we are able to design and live a path free from constraints of both what has been and what will be. I think this idea works all too well with urbanism. While many previous urban planners having tried to shape our cities for the future, for things like cars or organized society, and escaping the problems of the past like crime or pollution by just moving it somewhere else, we write ourselves a path of fate that is not always in our favor. In order to truly move forward, we must understand thoroughly of the present, of which we can act upon it more wisely. Jane Jacobs states that great cities are complicated systems of multiple networks of chaotic order, and everyone making their own little plans. But to try and shape this complicated, organic system in a way for us to understand it more easily can destroy the already existing order. I think cities should be about accessibility and its easement, not just about mobility. Fate is typically attributed as unchangeable in other cultures, the pre-existing conditions and resources given to us that we cannot change. But in Norse, word or fate can be changed, and I think that if cities thought more considerately in serving the already existing intricate networks of human functions, given the accessibility to achieve our own little plans among many other plans in a sea of streets and people, can we write our own fate? The plaza is designed after the web of word, the rune meaning fate. It is a portrayal of the weaving of fate in that this rune contains all the shapes of the other runes. Therefore, it represents all of the past, present, and future possibilities. The web of word is a reminder that the actions of the past affect the present, and that the present actions affect the future. All life and timelines are inextricably interconnected, where the slightest touch of one thread can cause the whole web to tremble. In a sense, 
It is a representation of the tree of life. Cities are centers of life. They are an amalgamation of peoples, cultures, and history. They are adaptive and an intricate web of connections between communities, public spaces, economies, and more. Everything is peculiarly interconnected, and when we disturb the dynamics of this ecosystem, waves ripple throughout the urban and social fabric of the city landscape. A few people have thought that I was supposed to be making a typical futuristic city, and the wonder of science fiction is that it can be anything than just the stereotypical. However, that is just a fictional stage, a vehicle to help move the series along, as this series is notably an educational one, where the green urban designs of the city are derived from the natural world, the sciences, urbanism, the innovations of today, and the great thinkers of our past like Carl Sagan, William White, and Jane Jacobs. From the first few episodes of Aster Year and up until now, it has been a huge learning experience for me as you can see the changes I've made throughout the city and hopefully this was a learning experience for you too. New York was definitely a great experience and I enjoyed it very much. In order to move forward into the future, we must first see the tools we presently have and learn from the mistakes of our past. The lead game designer of City Skylines, Carolina Corpu, spoke at TED 2017 The Future You conference a few months ago about how virtual cities can help develop real cities. She presented one example of a design competition by a small town in Finland who was seeking designs for an area of land within the town. People who played the game submitted their designs, and it could be possible that they would choose among these submissions. We, humans, are becoming an urban species. So cities, they are our natural habitat. That is where we live. In 2014, over 54% of the world population was living in cities. Astangia by Yuto. He actually did an interview with an actual urban planner called Jeff Speck. And Speck is an expert on the concept of walkability. The, the basic idea is that if you want your citizens to walk, which is kind of beneficial, uh, you actually need to have walking as a as a reasonable means of transportation. It, it should be a good way to reach places. So what Yutho did was that he explained this concept, he had spec explained too, and then he applied it to the city that he was building. These are the people who are coming up with new kinds of solutions. We know that cities are growing, they're getting bigger as we go, and the uh, percentage of population living in cities is projected to rise. So we need the solutions. And these people playing the game, they are trying out different kinds of solutions. They might have something that is really important. What we're seeing here is dream cities that might be real one day. So it might be that this is not just a game. It might be a way to decide our fate. Thank you. But before you go about displaying your dream city to city councils around the world, please go and explore. Walk the streets of your city and interact with the locals. Observe how people use the environment to see and understand the deeper problems that presently exist. And with that, we might just be a little bit more neighborly. I want to end with this piece by Jane Jacobs in which she called the Sidewalk Ballet, the daily complex order of city life that takes place on streets and sidewalks of neighborhoods with the regular citizens being the characters of the show, in which she described as the art form of the city. Under the seeming disorder of the old city, wherever the old city is working successfully, is a marvelous order for maintaining safety of the streets and the freedom of the city. It is a complex order, its essence of intricacy of sidewalk use, bringing with it a constant succession of eyes. This order is all composed of movement and change, and although it is life, not art, we may fancifully call it the art form of the city and liken it to dance. Not to a simple-minded precision dance, with everyone kicking up at the same time, trolling in unison and bowing off in mass, but to an intricate ballet in which the individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts, which miraculously reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. The ballet of a good city sidewalk never repeats itself from place to place, and in any one place is always replete with improvisions. Thank you for watching. If you like my work, please support me on my Patreon. In the next episode of Astroia, I will be talking about urban farming and community farming.
But until then, I'll see you guys in the future. Thank you.